Um, thank you all for coming uh, to the Faculty Teaching and Learning Center. This is our second content-based workshop, and we're so happy to have um, David Morris, uh, English professor, to talk to us about critical thinking. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Lynn Shaw, and I'm the Faculty Professional Development Coordinator, and I encourage you to give me any ideas you have about what would be best for you in terms of professional development next year. This is our center, and we plan to offer ongoing workshops and ongoing activities throughout the year, uh, including a long-term, uh, hopefully tied to the salary scale, uh, training about how to be a better teacher. So thank you so don't much don't for coming. David? Yes, don't, don't worry about it. Okay, hi. Um, I know or have met pretty much everybody here. As Lynn said, I'm David Morris. I'm, uh, not quite certain how I was, you know, elected for the, you know, particular, you know, honor of presenting this workshop, um, but happy to share whatever it is I do next. Actually, know regarding critical thinking. Um, so we had originally, um, I had actually put together a PowerPoint, which was the very first actual that I ever actually put together myself. But uh, you know, we didn't actually get it set up in time, so I had the experience of learning to present, put that together anyway. Um, I'm better with critical thinking than I am with technology, fortunately. So, um, so but you do have a packet that um, I did put together, and that was probably more important anyway. So certain things, I thought the first thing to do would just be to talk a little bit about, at least for me, what critical thinking means. And so I started with a handout that I use in my classes, and one reason I wanted to use it is because there's a quotation at the top of the first page that I like and that I talk about with my critical thinking class. Um, it's from a book by Louis L'Amour, The Haunted Mesa, who, yes, educated people aren't supposed to like Louis L'Amour, I know, but I happen to, so that's okay. Um, the, um, and the quotation is, a scholar does not accept the questions, examines, then suggests a possibility. And again, I talked through this with my class, the various things about that that I like as a description of critical thinking. Um, first of all, talking about it, starting with the phrase, as a scholar, um, pointing out that this is different from the average person on the street, um, that people in general have a real tendency to simply believe what they are told, um, what they hear on television, that a scholar, which is what we are trying to turn them into, um, should be able to do better, um, does not accept, um, and again, the aspect, and he questions the idea that decisions are made not just accepting what you hear, not just believing what you hear, but questioning, reasoning, asking for evidence, having something to base your decisions on rather than just emotion, rather than just feeling, and always looking at things skeptically and questioning and saying, you know, where is this coming from and why should I believe it? Um, and then finally, the last part, then suggest the possibility, to point out that there's almost always more than one side to just about anything, that you're not trying to come to an absolute, this is the right answer, so much as to this is a reasonable possibility, a reasonable conclusion based on the information that we've acquired through the questioning, through the examination, and with the knowledge always that there is another point of view and that you should respect that um, and try to incorporate the other possibilities. But most of all, not simply settling for the easy answer on things. So again, I like that quotation and um, just for the kind of definition that it gives to me, um, I think that critical thinking, very importantly to me, is as much about the process as it is about the answer, which um, I want to kind of point out when I talk about the testing part of this, because I think that's something that affects the kind of tests, you know, the kind of questions that you should ask, that you've got to be able to actually see the thinking process in order to get to critical thinking. Um, and that it's about evaluation. Um, why do you believe what you believe? Why should you believe this as opposed to that? So that there's always an evaluative ele um, element involved. So this first handout, again, just really briefly to go over, this is something I do at the beginning of the semester with my English 3 class. Um, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, because I'm pretty sure everybody here can you know, probably read you know, on their own. But um, the um, starting talking about that epigraph at the top of the page, and then just going through some of the other questions that I say that are useful for critical thinking, thinking about where information is coming from, what it is, um, you know, why they should believe it or why they might not. Thinking about the source of the information, is the person that you are getting the information knowledgeable, getting the information from, knowledgeable in a particular area? Does the person actually have some expertise? And I usually talk about advertising at that point. 
Um, how many advertisers, you know, just pull out somebody who's a celebrity, you know, point out to them that Michael Jordan might, is certainly an expert on basketball, um, might even be an expert on health, I might buy that. I don't think he really knows any more about underwear than I do, um, but yet Haynes underwear gets a lot of mileage out of him because people don't actually think about whether he has any actual knowledge in this area or not. Um, and other, you know, is there, you know, where is the information coming from from that person based on personal experience? Was the person looking at it from a particular point of view, thinking a little bit about bias? Are there reasons for the person to have a particular opinion? Um, thinking about if there is statistical or factual information, are there, you know, do you know the sources of that information, how it was compiled, are you given that, does it seem credible? Um, are the conclusions logical? So all of those are things I talk more about with the class you know, later on in more detail. But this is just a part of my introduction. And then the other part of this that I did want to talk about on the second page of it, um, I talked through just looking up at things in detail and paying attention to detail because I think that's very important with this too. Um, so there are these sets of headlines on the second page and I talked to each of those individuals. The first one is 1A, white vigilante names five black hues, 1B, subway victim shoots five assailants. And first I asked them if anybody actually remembers Bernard Getz and the, you know, the subway shooting in, or the, in New York, which none of them at this point do, so I have to explain what actually happened you know, with this. But talk to the fact and talk about, okay, what's the difference between those two headlines and point out just the difference in wording that one you know, highlights you know, white and black, whereas the other one doesn't. One, you know, the difference of youths versus assailants, uh, victim versus vigilante, uh, mains versus shoots, and point out to them that neither one of these is an inaccurate statement about what happened, depending on your point of view. But that by looking at the way this is written, you can tell an awful lot about the biases or the opinions of the person that, it, that wrote it, and talk through each of those three different sets in that way. Um, and then do an exercise maybe with the things at the bottom, you know, asking them to kind of come up with their own ideas on how headlines would be written for various different, um, different activities. Another thing, just in terms of class activities, um, that something that I worked on a lot on my sabbatical project had to do with reading and with critical reading. And so I also talked to them a lot about that a lot with some of these same issues, thinking about where information is coming from, um, who, what the source of that information is, and so some of those same kind of questions that I just pointed out, um, talking about audience awareness, talking about you know, how well claims are supported or documented, talking about biases. Um, but then there's an exercise on the next page of the, of the handout that I gave you that I also developed as part of my sabbatical project, and this is kind of fun. Um, it's a quotation from Barack Obama's book, The Audacity of Hope, um, and talks about, you know, a very brief quotation, talks about the first time he met George Bush. Um, which was at a party when he first went to, um, when he was first elected to the Senate, kind of a welcoming thing for new senators. And he talks about meeting Bush and having a little casual conversation with him and Bush kind of warning him about, you know, watch your step because people will be out to get you here. And then throwing, as he, you know, as they're talking, he realized afterwards he kind of threw his arm around Bush's shoulder as they were talking. Said, wonder what the Secret Service agents in the room thought about that, you know, basically. And so then there are questions at the bottom here and what I asked the students to do is, I guess this bled over onto the next page, which is didn't print the same way originally that I put it. Um, probably my fault with my formatting. Um, but the, um, so on each one of those, there are five spaces between, and there's two different ways to finish the statement. So for example, the first one, Bush's comments to Obama show that he's trying to either A, threaten and intimidate a popular new senator, senator or B, giving, give good advice and an honest warning. And I point out to them the five spaces that this is not just a black and white. If you completely agree with one, you check on that side. If you completely can't decide, you're in the middle. You can be leaning one way or the other with the five different spaces. And I give them a couple of minutes to answer those questions and talk through each one of them and kind of say, okay, how many of you checked this box? How many of you checked that one? And talk and ask them to give their reasons and try to use that to get them to be conscious of their own biases at that point. And I chose the Obama and Bush quotation specifically for that reason, because obviously a whole lot of them do have biases in one direction or the other um, based on their feelings. And just ask them to give their reasons and point out where those reasons are coming from. You know, whether in many cases it's because they happen to like Obama or Bush, because of their general feelings about politics, um, you know, will be what the conclusion comes out to be based on because they, you know, their own knowledge of a particular situation or their own, you know, background knowledge of the two individuals 
So, again, yeah, but try to, again, without saying this is the right answer, because none of these in any case is the right answer, but say, think about how you got to that answer and talk through. This is something, again, I've been using for the last couple of semesters and that has worked really well just in terms of getting some conversation going and pointing out to them that as they're reading about other, you know, thinking about other people's biases they're reading, they need to be conscious of their own too, so. Um, okay. And then on the next page, just briefly, another one of the things I do, this is just an exercise that I do when I'm talking about counter-argument, about thinking about other people's <laughs> positions, um, where they are coming from, thinking about your position and how somebody might respond to it. So this is after a section in class talking about counter-argument, responding to other people's positions. And I break them into groups um, with these two different questions here. One has to do with the PE requirement at community colleges and whether it should be there. Um, the other one having to do with kind of the Patriot Act issues that you know, the Bush administration um, brought up and about you know, the rights of the government to do investigation without a court order. And what I do is break them into different, four different groups in the class and say, okay, I want this group to come up with the reasons in support of this. I want this group to come up with the reasons against. And, and then after I've given them a few minutes to do that, I say, okay, I pull the papers away from them, they put these down, give them to the opposite group and say, okay, now talk about how you would answer, okay, what this group gave. Um, they actually have great fun doing that. They come up with great, greatly silly stuff in a lot of cases, but I think it's still, um, um, still something. My favorite last spring was on the physical education one that if you're ever being chased by wolves, you'll be able to get away if you've had PE. So, um, so, um, and the way that the other, I can't remember how the other group answered it, but by golly, they did. Uh, so that's, um, so again, just interesting to get them talking. And you know, most of this is just to get them thinking about their own thought processes in various ways. Um, the next section I was going to talk about was tests. And again, the main thing for me with tests, and um, this was a big debate we had a couple of years ago. We had a retreat up in, um, in Big Bear have, you know, talking about critical thinking and that sort of thing. I think Kirsten was there, if I remember correctly. Were you there at that was, retreat? I think it was Lisa. Lisa, okay, yeah, okay. Lisa and Diane were there, okay. And, um, yeah, there were a couple of members of our department there. Um, and we had a big debate there because my position then and still is that you cannot assess critical thinking through multiple choice or yes, no questions because they don't give you the process by which the student got to that answer. Again, if you can't see the process, you don't know what the thinking was that went into it. And again, we had extended debate about this, but I still believe it very strongly that if you want to test critical thinking, you've got to give students some kind of way to explain. And the example that came up up there, one of the things that we were talking about was a question that somebody had written having to do with um, and I think it was basically, it was a multiple choice, but basically came down to um, Jessica Simpson as a spokesmodel for, for this you know, health product, this you know, facial product, that sort of thing. Is she somebody that you should see as a credible source? Okay. Now, I think most of us wanted the students to say no. You know, when it was that, that we didn't feel like you know, this actress that was you know, particularly a good source. But I tried to point out to them, to me, on the other hand, all no answers are not equal. If the student's answer was, yes, she's a good source because she's involved in an industry where her appearance is important, that you know, this is something she's got to be very conscious of, okay, I'm still not sure that makes her an expert on you know, health products. But it's a much better answer than, yes, she's a good source because she, you know, she's really pretty and she looked really cute in those little shorts in the Dukes of Hazzard. Okay? And, and there's, there's still thought process behind one of those and not the other, and if you can't see that thought process, then you can't really make a good judgment as to what, you know, how the student got there. So, again, I think the ability for students to explain, that doesn't mean that all tests, that every question on every test has to be measuring critical thinking. So I'm not saying that true false questions or multiple choice questions shouldn't ever be on a test. I'm saying that part of the test isn't really measuring their thinking. Um, and different parts of tests might measure different things. So. Um, so giving students at some point in the test, if you're concerned with critical thinking, through various different sorts of things. Short answers, um, paragraphs, and I think, yeah, I put a couple of test questions from my own literature classes on here just as kind of suggestions. Um, so one of the things that I do, again, for teaching literature, is pull out different quotations that we have talked about from the works in class. This is kind of standard for English classes. There's several English teachers in the room now. Um, and um, ask them to first just identify the quotation. So there is, again, a kind of a true-fault sort of an aspect of this as well. Where did it come from? Who was saying it? Who was the writer? 
but then also a large part of it explaining, okay, why is this important? What does it mean? And again, that why is it important part of it, um, being at least part of the question, is pushing them to actually think and come to some sort of conclusion about things. Um, again, this is from, I think, my world literature class. So, um, yeah, the first one is Machiavelli. The second one is um, Dante. And the third one is Milton, if I remember correctly on all of them. So, um, but again, yeah, just some explanation of what's going on here and why is it important. And then the next one, um, again, sorry, kind of an essay question. This is something that, that I've given, again, on a midterm exam. Choosing one of these concepts, and I've listed several different options for them. Writing a short discussion, just a couple of paragraphs. So again, not necessarily turning everything into an essay exam. That's not what I'm trying to push. But something where they have a chance to explain things. Um, of, okay, what, you know, how, you know, choose a couple of different works that we have read, and how do they deal with this particular concept differently or similarly? So they have a chance, again, some kind of analysis, some sort of, and I also do identification sorts of things on my midterms. Again, I'm not saying that this should be everything, but I think it should be an element of things to give them a chance to do some analysis as much as you know, just identifying information. So, um, the, let's see. And then I also, in terms of writing assignments, again, I think it's very important always to me for any kind of an essay assignment um, that it not be a yes or no question. And I think a lot of people do have a tendency to just you know, put out a question and just answer this. Again, if it's yes or no, um, you know, that's a, an extremely short answer you know, at that point. And yes, you can say justify your answer or something like that. But I think that the question is still a lot stronger if you, you know, give something where it gives a broader range of answers than, than just two. Um, so I also put on the end here a, um, a couple of examples from different classes. The first couple come from my critical thinking class, from my English 3, and these are just two different types of questions. Um, first one is the one I often start the um, semester with. And so something to get them thinking about their own thinking processes more, once again. So the asking them to just choose an issue and choose a couple of different articles that are dealing with it from different perspectives. And the question is just for them not to come to a conclusion on the issue, but to try to identify why, you know, what the author's biases are, what they can tell about these writers from what they say that would help them to identify why these writers are disagreeing on this. And again, I'd say, you know, I'm not asking you for your opinion on the issue at this point. The writers are talking about the issue. You're talking about the writers, and I want you to analyze what you can tell about them. Again, getting them to be more conscious of analysis, of bias. Um, the second one here, which I give a little later in the um, semester on occasion, um, more of a issue-based question, but still something, um, so it's phrased here having to do with the media and about the way the media um, reports on public figures, on politicians, on entertainers. And the question that I ask here, what legal restrictions, if any, should be placed on the media regarding the reporting of information about the private lives of public figures? Um, again, not, a yes, no, not should there be restrictions, and not the yes or no question, but okay, if there should be any, what should they be? Um, and I do include the if any there to give them the, okay, there shouldn't be any, but point out, okay, then you've got to be able to justify that as well. But again, my, what concerns me is not what the answer is, but how they go about justifying and backing up that answer. And I think something like that gives a little broader range of you know, possible answers. Those are for, again, our second level composition class. So those are students who are generally you know, planning on transferring, planning on moving on. So on the next page, I also included a couple from, um, one from our lower level composition class, um, English 801, which is a non-degree applicable basic skills class. But, so it's a much simpler question. Just choosing a particular person who has influenced you, who's changed the way you look at the world or made some difference in your life, okay, and then give me you know, at least a pay say. But again, the question isn't tell me about an important person. It's not just informational. It's still got an analytical aspect to it. How did that, you know, in what way did the person you've chosen affect your life? So I think always on anything that I ask, I'm always, even something as simple as this, still trying to get that analytical element into it and still saying, give me some explanation, not just here's the information, not just an identification or a description, but something that's asking them to try to make a case on something. Those are for composition classes, which is mostly what I teach. But the same kind of principle, I think, could apply to most content classes as well, history, sociology, pretty much anything. 
So I included one from my literature class here at the end too. Um, this one um, coming from a mythology class, where again, we talked about different cultures and the way that they talk about you know, their gods and the, the way that the humans looked at their, um, their religious structure and that sort of thing. So the question here, again, how is the relationship between humans and gods characterized differently in the two works you've chosen? Um, again, asking for a comparison, asking for not just identifying, but doing some analysis. And I think that's one of the biggest things to me, just in terms of thinking, of teaching critical thinking, is pushing them to be conscious, not just to do the analysis, not just to not give them an easy way out and to continually push them, but also to try to make them conscious of the fact that you're doing that and conscious of the analysis that they are doing. Um, remind them to be looking for biases, remind them of their own biases as things come up. Um, and I've had that happen in a number of different occasions, and I use the examples in my classes, um, how if they are not conscious of their own biases, they will make mistakes on things. Um, I use an example um, that a number of years ago, I was, I think it was when I was teaching at USC, but it was during the presidential campaign. Um, must have been uh, the year that Clinton was first elected, um, because it was when the debates were going on. And topic that I had given the students just had to do, because there was a presidential campaign going on, so the, you know, just had to do with what would make a good president, what you know, would make a good leader, something along those lines. And one of my students um, came to the conclusion that honesty was important, which I'm sure we would all love to see from our politicians if we could find it. So, you know, so I wanted to talk about honesty. And he was actually doing this paper at the time the vice presidential debate had happened between Al Gore and um, Dan Quayle. And so he found in the LA Times several examples of places where during this, you know, an article talking about several places where Al Gore had perhaps stretched the truth during this debate um, or had presented things in, you know, <clears throat> questionable manners, which, as I pointed out in the class, would have been perfectly fine, except on the same page of the LA Times, there was another article pointing out three different places where Dan Quill had flat out lied, okay, um, in much more definite terms. But the student was a staunch Republican, and he didn't want to use the better example because it was making the Republican candidate look bad. And so I try to point out just the way that their own biases, okay, the student wrote a worse paper than he could have. I didn't care if he was Democrat or Republican. I wanted the better example, and him, him letting his biases get in the way. And so I try to highlight that sort of thing as much as I can. And it's not hard to find examples of your own students or of our politicians or our legal system doing things like that. And again, try to make them as conscious as possible of the thought processes, of the analysis, um, as I can. So that's, um, in brief, most of the way that I think about um, teaching and presenting critical thinking in various different ways. Um, we talked about setting this workshop up. Um, we agreed that it would be useful um, maybe for me to give a short presentation, but also to have this be a discussion, too and the idea of how you go about um, or think about approaching these things. So um, I'm about, again, finished with the handout that I gave you and willing to open that up. Does, do any of you have any thoughts or anything that you would like to share in terms of how you go about teaching critical thinking? Or feel free to attack anything I've said. That's fine, too. So I can handle it. Yeah. Um, I'm in the math and engineering department, so most of our answers are black and white. This is the answer, you know. And, um, but. To engage this critical thinking, it's hard to turn on the brain because they don't care. You know? <laughs> and and, they, and they, they're just here because they just have to get the class done. And so, what I in, in, to bring out the critical thinking, you know, to bring out that extra discussion, um, I put it light of, well, why? How do you know? And in the back of my mind, why do you care? <laughs> And so, you know, if we're talking about politics, I mean, we're all like, you know, we want to discuss them, right. talk about that. But if I'm talking about trying to find the pH of a certain acid and how much we add a, a base to it, oh, God. <laughs> what if I tell them, you know, you're a nurse, and, or you want to be in, the, in this profession, and I put that in discussion where they have, to, they have to get the answer right, or maybe a patient die or something, you know, something like that. And they go, okay, I think I should know about this. And that's sort of the way I sort of turn that spigot on, like, why would they care, you know, if you're an architect, if you're going to be a builder. You need to know these things, percentages, decimal, things like that. Yeah, well, so that's sort of the framework that I try to put it in, other than let's just find the answer because this is the answer. And, uh, and it's sort of tough in math because 
you know, that sort of, you don't really like to use right. those type of skills, unless they can see a direct connection of why, of how they can use it right. later on. Well, I think that, that you're right. Different, I think the principles stay the same. I think the principles apply differently in different disciplines. And so, um, yeah, with what you're talking about, um, without ever having actually taught math or engineering, of course, but, um, and not knowing a whole lot about it, to be very honest, I, but I think the, but what you just described, yeah, problem solving is also a, you know, a critical thinking exercise, but again, that's still the process of thinking how you got to where you got to. And so I think, you know, in some places, my immediate thought on that, again, speaking to somebody completely outside the field, just is, as you said, you know, giving them scenarios, giving them, you know, even hypothetical, you know, how would you deal with the situation? How would you solve that? Um, that's something that we use all the time. That's something that we use in our hiring processes. Is our, you know, HR likes us to give people that, you know, hypothetical situations for how you would handle this. Because again, it does more than just give a brief answer, but gives people a chance to explain why they're doing what they're doing. And so I would think even in something that was, you know, more of a hard science sort of thing, um, still giving them, you know, in addition to, yes, as you're right, some things are, you know, you need this particular answer, but giving them also an opportunity for some things that are kind of scenarios or situations where they could explain how they got to those answers would also encourage that thought process, too, I would think. Yeah. David, how do you reconcile uh, student learning outcomes and evaluating these tasks that you give students if you're trying to evaluate critical thinking and then you have a rubric that says, did they spell all the words right? Or I, I'm not sure how you <laughs> sort of match those two things because um, while well, I teach in electrical technology and I teach math classes, so um, you know, in a way, it's simpler for me. But I still try to get my students like you, like, why do you even care? You know, and I'm always saying you have to learn algebra because, and you know, give them all the reasons that I have, and then uh, they then they come up with their own too. Uh, students will add to it, but how do you reconcile that whole sort of maybe top down or I don't know where it came from, but the whole student learning outcomes and evaluation. Well, I think um, maybe in a couple of ways, and other people here might have you know, thoughts on that too. Um, again, I'm not trying to present myself as the absolute you know, expert on it, on, on all of this, but my own thought on it um, is that a couple of things, and the biggest one, the most important thing to me with that, yeah, there are, Critical thinking is one of the things that you're evaluating. So yes, it would be one of the things on a rubric. It's not the only thing, and you're evaluating a various, you know, a set of different outcomes. And so, and you can do those, you know, even within looking at an essay, you can look at, okay, how well did they do this? How well did they do that? There are separate points of the rubric that you might be looking at. But the other thing that I think is important um, with the student learning outcomes is to remember a number, the original language and what our former researcher here um, used to push very hard was the term measurable student learning outcomes. Um, and several years ago, the now very much under fire president of the um, accrediting commission, Barbara Bino, actually signed a memo with the State Academic Senate in which she you know, officially recognized that it was legitimate for us to substitute the word observable for measurable. And the whole point behind that was to say, not everything is quantifiable. Not everything is, I mean, some of these things are, you know, things that are a little more subjective. That doesn't mean that you don't know whether your students are doing them or not. So I think for, for something like critical thinking, very often it's going to fall to me more into the observable rather than the technically quantifiably measurable category. And again, according to the Accreditation Commission and the memos we got, that's okay. Um, that we can go about evaluating things in that way and still come up with our own ways. And there are multiple different ways to be able to assess student learning outcomes. It's, you know, it can be essays, it can be for po portfolios, it can be tests, it can be various different things. And you apply the ones that are appropriate for the particular you know, way that you're going about doing things, I think. So other people may have other thoughts on how to, and we've got other, or not. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, I teach art history, and um, certainly in writing, I've been able to evaluate. I mean, they do essays and papers and mm -hmm. write on exams. So in that way, I can assess their critical thinking. But I'm, I'm fascinated by your discussion, because that's one of the things that I find the hardest to implement um, in a class of 40 or 44 students. And so I was wondering what the size of some of your classes are and how you get them into little groups 
and keep them talking about a topic rather than about the football game or <laughs> whatever. I mean, I know there's techniques, yeah. but I've found them very hard to implement in a large class. Um, well, that is one, yes, again, different disciplines, and yes, our classes are cl slightly smaller. Um, so, maybe not even slightly, if you, you know, in some <laughs> cases. The, um, officially, the cap for a composition class here is supposed to be 28. Um, for the last two semesters, it's been 31, yeah. obviously. So, yeah, we do have, you know, about, you know, a 33%, you know, smaller class than you're talking about there. But our literature classes certainly get up to, you know, 35 on occasion, or, you know, between, I've had, as, you know, even a few more than that on. Um, and, again, I think... Number one, um, there's a judgment to make in terms of the amount of time to give them in those groups so that they've got time to do the work without time to, okay, I finished and now I'm going to wander off into other stuff, you know, sort of things. I also, again, speaking for myself, and again, other people may have other, other thoughts on this, um, I'm very conscious, I tend to design the groups in advance and be very conscious of who I put with whom. Mm -hmm. um, I will, I mean, if I'm doing group work in class, I'm very conscious of breaking up people who I know hang out together, okay, outside of class, who I know, you know, sit together regularly, because they are more likely to get into their own, you know, sort of stuff. I'm very conscious of the ethnic makeups of the groups. I made the mistake once when I was teaching at LA Trade Tech of putting together a group without, you know, considering um, the ethnic makeup, and they started conducting everything they were doing in Spanish. <laughs> Um, which made it a little hard for me to follow their conversation, um, although I've gotten much better at Spanish since then. But at the time, um, I'm like, no, you have to do this in English, actually. But that, um, there's, you know, just thinking about the makeup um, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of gender, in terms of who talks a lot and who doesn't, um, or, you know, various different things like that. So one of the things that I do with that, I think, is just a real consciousness. I work very hard, especially if it's going to be any kind of an extended activity. Um, if I'm doing peer editing groups or something like that for essays, I will put a considerable amount of time into deciding this is who I want working with whom and this is who I really don't want to have you know, with that person um, in order to try to facilitate a little better discussion. So that, um, and again, I think you have to monitor um, you know, and kind of sometimes, you know, I try not to snap, but you know, very gently, okay, I'm, I think you may have wandered off track and need to get back to it at this point. So. As I said, other people may have other thoughts on how to go about controlling the group work too. Yeah. No, this is not exactly critical thinking, but another thing to kind of help in small groups is make the students accountable for something. Mm -hmm. So either give each student, let's say there's four of them a task, so one maybe is watching the time and one is making sure that everyone and one has a chance to speak, and or you might say that I'm randomly going to call on one of you to summarize the group discussion. So it kind of makes them all aware of paying attention. They think, oh no, I don't want to be the only one that wasn't <laughs> able to summarize. So just giving some kind of accountability to the groups, I think, kind of keeps them on task as well. Um, I do, uh, I form them in study groups, but I let them pick anyone they want. But I uh, learned this thing in a training that I actually have them physically, like, move the tables and move the chairs, and they all have to face each yeah, other. Perfect. And that whole activity, at first I thought, oh God, I'm wasting so much time having to move everything, but now they just do it like that. Okay, get in your study groups, boom, like, I mean, like three minutes, they've moved all the tables and chairs and they're all sitting there. Okay, send your group leader up to pick up the paper. So I assign a group leader and those group leaders like take it so seriously, you know, and that really helps control the group because then the group leader is controlling their group. Sort of the same thing that Emily said, but um, I find the group work and the peer pressure or peer, peer to peer is really great for math. It's math and that, that is, I like, I like the small group work and the peer peer-to-peer -peer group. Yeah. And I think it depends, again, a little bit on the activity. Again, if I'm doing something where I'm only going to give them three or four minutes, then, you know, I might do this, you know, a little more randomly and with, you know, just put them with somebody a little more nearby to say, again, if it's going to be any kind of an extended activity, I also tend to make certain that I don't put them with the same person each time as much as possible. So that they are, they, I think that does a couple of different things. Number one, they get a little less, a little less comfortable with the group, a little less likely to be chatty but more comfortable with the class as a whole because they've actually gotten to talk to more people. So I think that also helps facilitate the larger you know, discussion when the whole class is talking too. So that's, does anybody, did anybody else have any thoughts, Sarah's question with the, um, any other thoughts just in terms of any of uh, the critical thinking in general of ways to teach it? Again, any criticisms of what I did, you know, present to More than welcome. I'm, again, <laughs> It seems to be something topical that activates everyone and 
you know, they just can't wait to yeah. get something. You know? um, yeah. I'm right now, but it's, no, I think you're absolutely right. But with the map, it seems you have to sort of keep them. Yeah. <laughs> Takes <laughs> creativity we, sometimes. We have to talk about some of the mundane, they think, dry things to get to that level. Um, I'm talking about like functions of graph, you know. And, where, where do we get the most profit? But if I say, well, there's this new uh, application, you know, for iPhones, and how much money you have to input to get, you know, your profit? Like, oh, <laughs> you know, you know. But if I say, salesman A wants to do this, and salesman B is this, and yeah, you know, so that's I find helpful. Yeah, I think you're right. in any, not just for critical thinking, but you know, with any, even more that you can connect it to something that they think matters to them. Um, yeah, it's going to be. So yeah, created that relevance. Um, again, that was um, something that I did a lot of, again, when I was teaching up there at LA Trade Tech, which again is downtown LA. They have an almost entirely minority population. Um, theoretically, they have a 4% Caucasian population, but I taught there for three and a half years full time and I never saw anybody that would have fallen into that group. So, um, so I knew that there was a different you know, background. You know, it's almost a direct split between African American and Hispanic. And, um, I knew there was a different background than what I had there. So, you know, I would make a conscious effort of going to movies and that sort of thing that I probably wouldn't have seen otherwise, but it gave me a frame of reference or, you know, with music to be able to bring up stuff that, and sometimes in comical ways that I didn't intend to be comical, but nevertheless, it was an effort, you know, that, um, you know, that they generally tended to appreciate. So I think, yeah, the more that you can tie things, you know, either, you know, by bringing up, you know, you said, you know, here's this new app, that sort of thing, or, I think, again, for anything, making them conscious of how they would actually use this in a real world kind of a situation, you know, how this is something, how this is something they could actually apply makes it more, more relevant too, so. Yeah. Any other thoughts with? Well, um, then I guess, um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I don't know that I, you know, had any big impact on anything, but I, you know, I appreciate the conversation and thank everybody for, for coming in. So could, yes. <laughs> I, I just like everybody to go around and say their name, where they teach, and you know, and the classes that you teach, so we can kind of all know a little bit about each other before we all go back to whatever we Discourse. were doing. Yeah, yeah, let's let's enjoy this uh, this sort of brain thinking, <laughs> ac true academic environment for mm -hmm. another moment. So, uh, my name is Alan Hopkins. I'm an adjunct instructor. Uh, in the math and engineering department, and um, I teach at night, and then during the day I uh, work for the Department of Defense. Wait a minute, before you go, what do you teach at night? What classes? Uh, I teach all the math courses. Oh, so you uh, teach a variety. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. From uh, intro to math to pre-calculus. Okay, thank you. <coughs> My name's Sherry Viner. I teach here. Psychol I'm an adjunct as well. Psychology and introduction, and also human sexuality. Great. I'm Kirsten Marino. I'm in the English department, and I teach uh, composition and the occasional literature course. I'm Kelly Iyer, also from the English department, and I teach composition. I'm Lynn Shaw, and I teach uh, math in the electrical technology department, sort of an entry level whole numbers to algebra cram course. <laughs> I'll make one of those. Yes. <laughs> I have a lot of people like you in my class, actually. Um, my name is Sarah Buer, and I teach art history, so it's everything from cave art to yesterday. I'm Emily German. I work in the Multidisciplinary Success Center, and sadly, I don't teach right now. I miss it. I'm Shauna Hageman. I'm a counselor in Disabled Student Services, and I teach Counseling One. Oh, yeah, and me, yes. Um, and I'm um, David Morse. I'm um, in the English department. Teach, yeah, as Kirsten said, all levels of composition and the um, and literature classes. Um, and I'm also, just for reference, if it's useful to anybody, also a member of both of our Senate Executive Committee, Academic Senate Executive Committee, as Shauna is. And I'm also a member of the Statewide Academic Senate Executive Committee. So. Just a comment. Um, I found in the past couple of years, uh, actually during one of these workshops, I met a counselor. And I uh, was, I forget her name. I have it written down in my book. But um, what we do is uh, once a semester, towards the end of the semester, I have her come in for like a half an hour, 40 minutes. It's really useful for the students because this, you know, 
the students really don't know really sometimes they know what a counselor is about and the, the role that, that, that she plays and where they play and then she gives an introduction of what you know what's going on and, and then the students also they just pepper them questions you know if I had this course as a transfer and it you know I think for that half an hour 45 minutes it's, it's really worth the students time and the counselors time because she can address like 45 students and at the end they feel very satisfied about you know I'm very comfortable with you know the path I'm taking I'm in the right math course I'm in the right whatever it is so I thought that was very useful we love to come to class Yes. <laughs> they used to send out something a kind of offering that mm -hmm. and unfortunately I think with budget cuts and that sort of thing they don't any longer send the announcement yeah. but yeah I have um, Ruben Page from the Counseling Center come to all of my composition classes every semester to give a present you know yeah, and yeah. yeah, and yeah. All you've got to do is contact Ruben. He's more than happy to do it. And yeah, I think I agree completely. It's something the students always appreciate and benefit from. Probably the ratio between student and counselor is like what four hundred to one or something. Yeah. I mean, so it's it's really hard to get an appointment with a counselor. And yes. I found I, I didn't know that. And again, it's because of one of these these meetings we have for Flex Day. I was able to. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. And it's really, it's probably actually higher than that at this I point. Say, yeah. that's, a, that's the, um, there are, right now, um, the State Academic Senate has this plenary session, um, leaving tomorrow actually to go up to San Francisco for it. And there are a couple of different resolutions that are trying to push for changes to Title V that would establish some kind of an acceptable counselor to student ratio. We have them for librarians, we don't have them for counselors, you know, those ratios. So we've got a couple of different. Um, resolutions trying to push toward establishing something to help with that but still even those ratios are still going to be you know a huge disparity and I think yeah the more you can get the counselor you know into the class to give the students access yeah I think it's always good completely agree actually I'm gonna have to go soon because I teach at one but I have a quick question because you mentioned counseling and, and uh, the student success centers and since my courses, none of them require any prerequisites, they, we've put in recommended preparation that they take English um, before they take art history, um, that they can read and write at English one level, but that doesn't happen for the majority of students in my classes. And so on the first day of class, I tell them all about the Student Success Center and the Reading and Writing Center, but I don't make, their, I don't make anything mandatory. And I haven't yet, but I'm thinking now maybe I should um, actually survey how many of them ever use it during the course of the semester. Um, and the few students who've told me that they've tried, there's this, again, uh, cutbacks that there's, it, they just can't walk in and get an appointment for someone to look at a paper or tell them about X, Y, and Z because they're in English 105 or something. And they can't quite get they're, they're not quite prepared to do what I'm asking them to do. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you had any recommendations for that situation. Well, yeah. first. <laughs> well that's, that's not my center that's writing oh. and reading. Okay. I know that the instructional specialist there, Rodney Rodriguez, he has worked with like an economics teacher and set up special sessions, how to do a certain writing assignment. So if you contact him, he might be able to do that. I'm not sure how it is though with the tutoring since that's not my center, but that's one suggestion. I know he's done that before. Rodney will set up you know, mm -hmm. individual presentations for, for classes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then just maybe to put your mind at ease in long-term planning, the Student Success Committee has a subcommittee working on mandatory prerequisites and identifying courses and pilot courses. So mm -hmm. it's going to take a while, but it is a hot topic. Oh, people are listening, right? <laughs> Actually, and I can also tell you for that, which might be you know, relevant to a couple of the rest of you as well, the, um, we're also working right now at the state level. The, right now, in order to put a prerequisite on a sequence course, like English 105 to English 1, all you need to have is just the content matching up. Okay, these are the exit skills, these are the entrance skills. To do it for anything else, it's a nightmare because you have to go through this big statistical analysis to actually get them to... We are working right now and are on the verge of completing, this is you know, almost a done deal at this point, a change to Title V, which would allow that content analysis for putting either writing, reading, or computation prerequisites on any course, which will make it much easier to do. And we've also talked about ways to implement this um, to encourage um, other disciplines to put those prerequisites in place. 
and Lynn knows several years ago we co-chaired a task force here where you know we suggested the prerequisites and went to a department head meeting and asked how many departments would be interested in having you know prerequisites on their courses and almost all the departments had said yes we think that would be great but nobody wants to do it because they're afraid of what it would do to their enrollment um, of course and so we have talked about ways to address some of those issues as well so there is a real move um, statewide to try to facilitate in numerous different ways actually because yeah right now the reality is you're teaching a transfer level art history class and you've got students who are at three levels below composition okay I'm trying to come in and do the reading and writing in that class it doesn't match and it doesn't work so we're trying to statewide create things that would help to address that in case anybody cares which probably most of you don't but if anybody had any other comments or anything like that they wanted to send I did bring some of my cards to leave out here so. Thank you, everybody. Oh, wait, before you go, you have to do an evaluation, please. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>